our little Zoom platform through uh, for innovating through COVID. So this is put on by the Placer Business Resource Center in partnership with the Sierra Small Business Development Center. If you have not heard of the Placer Business Resource Center, we specialize in helping entrepreneurs and small businesses, big businesses, anywhere from startup to expand by sell. And we're able to do this because of our partners, significant, uh, more specifically, the SBDC. Uh, our offerings are one-on-one uh, -on -one advising, um, business workshops, we have permit assistance, as well as and job connections or hiring events. And so just that's a little snippet of, oh, looks like more people are joining us. That's just a little snippet of kind of what we do. Um, our business workshops range anywhere from the very basics of business to financing, to um, buying a business, selling a business, succession planning, um, business planning to create your business plan, and a whole gamut of things. Um, our advisors are available to meet with you via virtual as of right now. Um, and they can guide you through and walk you through any part of your business that you're in. And you'll be paired with somebody who will work specifically with you on whatever it is that, uh, that your business needs are. The permit assistance is you'll contact me and I'll be pretty much your liaison between county or city government workers, whatever you need. As far as permit assistance goes, we want to make sure you have that information and then that's incorporated into your business plan and into any financials. You don't want to be surprised when I tell you uh, that you have a $10,000 traffic fee or it's going to cost you $4,000 for your building permit or whatever the case may be. And then our job connections, we partner with the Business Advantage Network. Um, which is a program of Health and Human Services. They offer hiring events as well as a program called Help to Hire. And um, we'll connect you with them and get you some employees if that's what, um, that's what you're needing. So with that, it looks like we have more people that have joined us since we started. So I'm gonna go ahead and kick this off over to Brian Gladden and he'll get you started on innovating through COVID. All right, thank you, Nicole. And if you guys didn't see, I started recording just so we have this for um, future for those folks who couldn't join us today. Looks like we got uh, Ali and Rod, um, Sequoia, Karina, um, and let's see, we got a few more who just joined us, Elizabeth. So appreciate you guys joining today. There's a lot of info here we're going to cover today, and hopefully you'll be able to join us again for the next two weeks as well as we go through this uh, journey. And whether you're starting a business or have one and just trying to innovate and survive and hopefully thrive through COVID. I'm going to keep my eye on anybody uh, joining us as well. So what are we going to cover today? Well, Innovating through COVID-19 uh, in week one. Um, we'll go through the agenda here today, what we're going to talk about. Real quickly, we're going to get through some of the you know, agenda, um, who am I, who's the SBDC real quick, so we can get into more of the meat of everything. This is not to give you, uh, to be, help you become an expert today. This information is going to give you high level information that you can then Either go back and do some research on your own or hopefully become an SBDC client and engage people like myself to help you. So uh, a lot of stuff that will make these slides available for you as well. Who am I real quick? Um, my name is Brian Gladden. I am a consultant for the Small Business Development Corp here for Placer County, but I have my own consulting firm, Strategy and Innovation Institute. I'm also uh, the entrepreneur in residence, which kind of means the lead entrepreneur for Sac State University's Carlson Center for Innovation. So I deliver webinars and help startups. Also uh, adjunct professor at Jessup. Um, so quite a bit of things going there and a lot of years in high tech sales, business development consulting. So I live here in Rockland and look forward to helping you. So today we're gonna talk about COVID, changing needs of the customer, the problem you're trying to solve and it's uh, changing 
and then why your purpose and this is really important that a lot of folks don't understand is how that affects what you do how you do it and how you proceed week two if you come back next week documenting this plan how we actually take what we learned today document that business model reimagine potentially the value prop to meet the new needs using some new uh, leading tools in the market as well as validating your offerings and testing those assumptions and then week three is really about the profits finances funding measuring managing uh, these new initiatives to your vision and mission so i'd love real quick just a uh, high level your name uh, what you do and um, with the end hopefully we have some more time to get into some more detailed questions about what you guys do so maybe ali you can uh, Tell me uh, your full name and what you do. Nope. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, I, my full name is Allie Ware, and um, I do not currently own a business, but I'm very interested in the idea of owning a business. Um, I work for the city of Roseville doing um, GIS for them, which is mapping. Um, and eventually, I would like to take that and, uh, you know, do that on my own. I really enjoy mapping um and being out on the ground doing that so that's why i'm here <laughs> awesome all right how about rod rod you're on there you go hi i'm with meals on wheels i'm the community outreach uh, manager and uh just looking for new ways of uh outreaching uh during this time of uh the pandemic Yes. All right. Thank you. How about Sequoia? You're on mute if you if you're uh, trying to speak. Okay. We'll move to Karina. Thank you, Sequoia. Hi everyone. I'm a. My name is Karina Williams. I'm a communication analyst for Unbiased Solutions. We're a cybersecurity firm based out of Folsom, California. I know, uh, I know Shoba, so tell her I said hi. Oh, great, I will. Very good. Glad to have you. How about um, Elizabeth? Hi, I'm just, um, I'm, I have a brown skin studio business in Rockland and just here to learn more about recovering from COVID. Changes. Awesome, all right, well, welcome. So let's, uh, let's dig in. So real quick, uh, Nicole did a great job about the Placer County Resource Center, SBDC, just a little bit more. The SBDC, what do they do? Why are they here? Well, they're really here to help small businesses in many areas, right? Which is whether it's funding, capital, you know, market research, um, certifications and trainings, really growing your business and getting the resources you need, whether that's just knowledge or money to help you survive. And that's really their goal. And how they get measured, really what they look at is how many businesses does the SBDC help start here in the Placer County area? Um, how many jobs are saved and created? Uh, sales increase, revenues, you know, and how much funding you obtain. So all these things help drive the economy. And that's really what SBDC is about here. And as, if you are signed up as a client, great. If not, I would uh, recommend that you do whether it's here in Placer County, if you have an office, or the, um, the Sacramento region, they call it the Capital Region. And then you have SBDC consultants like myself who can provide marketing or uh, strategy, or maybe it's mar a finance um, or HR consulting areas that you uh, need help in. All right, so let's get into the good stuff here. So the first section, COVID impact on changing customer needs. So we all know that COVID has affected just about every industry, some more than others. And we'll talk about that just for a few minutes on why this is impacting you, how it's changing certain industries and that you might wanna look at that are also um, on your radar. So at a high level, when we think about our business model, when, whether you have a business or you just have an idea and you're thinking of creating one, the first thing you can think of is your business plan or your business model. And that your business model is how you create and deliver and capture value. And this thing in the middle, which is hard to see, is not important, but that's your business model. And what is going on around you and your business, there are certain things affecting you. 
you know, key trends like uh, IT, uh, you know, technology things, market forces about um, things going on in your industry specifically, um, competition. Uh, and then we have things that we're going to talk about, macroeconomic forces. So what are those? Well, COVID would be one, right? Disease, war, uh, the price of the dollar, gas, these things that are global in nature, uh, could be region-wide, but they're affecting many people, not just one region or one industry. And COVID is one of those that is affecting all of us. So when we see these things that are happening that are affecting your business model, then we have to adjust. The question is, how do you adjust? What do you look at? And that's what we're going to dig, dig into in the following sections. But at a high level, we want to understand that chaos or this crisis creates an opportunity. And this goes back thousands of years here, the art of war, Sun Tzu, that in the midst of chaos, there's opportunity. And this is happening all around us. So you see new businesses starting, obviously there's many closing, but the ones that are starting are doing so because they're seeing an opportunity to meet new needs of the customer that are currently not being met because their needs have changed because of COVID. And you know, all of this, uh, there's two easy ones, right? We're on, I'm on Zoom right now. So we're meeting um, virtually instead of face-to-face, -face, we probably would have been at the Placer County Resource Center here in Rockland if this was a normal day but instead we're on Zoom. So this has affected that uh, part of the business. Also, all of us every day are having to figure out how we're gonna eat. And if we go out, are you, you know, distance? Are you taking it away? Um, so all these things are easy ones that we can think of in our daily lives. So there's opportunity there to innovate and do things differently. Why is that important? Well, McKinsey study there, and we're gonna go through quite a few of these things here. Um, they've done some great work. Innovating through crisis is financially a successful model. So this study from the last crisis, from 08, 09, they did a study. Those firms that really focused on innovating through the crisis outperformed their peers during the recovery period by over 30%. So innovating could be many things, right? Product development, internal innovation, uh, innovating to create new markets, right? All these things, whether it's just small incremental steps or big radical innovations. And there's a big difference there in degrees, but at the end of the day, they were focused on finding out the new pains and needs of the customers and innovating to those. So it's not just about sounds cool to innovate, it's financially rewarding, so you need to do it. And we're gonna focus on the next section really on how we do that. What need do we need to look at? How do we figure out what these needs are um, to really gain out of this crisis you know, a head start on our competitors? The problem is that most of you, as well as mid-sized, large, you know, Fortune 1,000 businesses, it doesn't matter the size, as executives and managers, you understand that there potentially is an opportunity to innovate and you want to innovate. Um, but you don't know how. So 90% believe that the COVID crisis is gonna fundamentally change how we do business the next five years. It's not just a small thing, right? It's never gonna be the way it was. The problem is only 21%, you know, maybe one out of the six of you on this call actually have the skills, resources, knowledge to innovate, right? So most executives, and don't feel bad if, you know, uh, hopefully you're here because you want that knowledge, doesn't matter if you're in a Fortune 50 company or a mid-sized firm or a small firm, how to innovate has always been a mystery. You know, what do I do? What tools do I use? How do I validate that you know, somebody cares and there's enough people there, there's a market? And that's what we're gonna to talk to you over these next three weeks. So that knowledge about how do I do it? How do I find out? How do I validate it, reduce my risk, quicker time to market? That's what we're gonna talk about. So let's look at some examples of how COVID has affected all of us. Um, real high level, to, to very uh, busy slide, so I'm not gonna go into details, but what this is showing us is that it has affected every aspect of our lives. When we think about us being at home now, most of you are probably watching me from your home office somewhere or the kitchen table, backyard, but we have changed our daily lives because of this. So from work, Obviously, we talked about Zoom, remote working, obviously unemployment, to shopping and consumption, right? Most of us are doing 
um, shopping online, e-commerce. We have less trips to the store, which is interesting, right? So larger baskets, reduced shopping. Um, and this one is really interesting, life at home. So talks about that home now is the new coffee shop, right? We do everything at home, um, whether it's entertainment, uh, online, or it is um, eating, it is uh, learning. So now we've got um, a whole thing of learning here from distance learning for kids. Most of you like me probably have kids that have gone back. So the consumption of information is completely different. Travel and mobility, as we all know, you know, travel industry is down. It's now domestic tourism, uh, local, regional, and health and well-being. So we're, a lot of us are doing virtual visits online, fitness on demand, so a lot of these things. The next slide will look a little more detail. So what are some examples? Well, digital transformation is an easy thing to look at, right? So we'll look at that first because that's affecting all of us. We've all seen how we've gone digital. And e-commerce is an easy one to look at here. Within, uh, we're, we're really looking at decades now in terms of days. So adoption of digital transformation e-commerce. What took 10 years to happen for e-commerce, Amazon, when you buy Costco, eBay, all these different things, has happened in eight weeks when COVID started. You know, the same adoption rate that took a decade, we did in eight weeks. So when people say, well, you can't do that and you can't do this, we did it out of necessity. Telemedicine, um, there was 10X in the first two weeks of COVID of people doing virtual appointments. Remote working, as we all know, we've seen and heard stats about video conferencing, 20 times the number of participants in three months that were ever doing virtual uh, conferences before. Remote learning, again, back to the kids, in two weeks, 250 million students went online. So is it optimized? Absolutely not, right? So we had to do it, but now the question is, how do you innovate to things like that? How do you um, find the gaps where things are not being done optimally, where there's still pains or problems or issues that you can identify and fill? And online entertainment, this one is really interesting. It took Disney, plus only five months to do what Netflix did in seven years. So what, they, what Netflix took seven years to get a customer base, Disney Plus did in five months, which is amazing. So there's opportunity, we just have to figure out how to find it, and then what do you do to make sure that you are meeting those specific needs. So here we're gonna kind of get into that now. We know there's an issue, how do we figure out where to focus? The focus needs to be on this idea of jobs to be done, and I'm putting that in air quotes. I don't know if any of you have heard of uh, this concept, jobs to be done before. If you have, give me a thumbs up in, in your uh, you know, window there or a thumbs down. So I'd love to understand if you heard that concept before. And we're, yeah, there you go, Karina says thumbs up. And maybe you're not good at using these tools, that's okay, good. You can put it in the chat screen if you can't find the thumbs up or the thumbs down. All right, so what do we mean by this term, jobs to be done? Well, you know, Tony Owick is uh, one of these father of this kind of idea of jobs to get done. Um, famous consultant, strategist, and uh, books out about it. Sequoia says thumbs up. So what does this mean? Well, really think about we buy a product or a service to get some job done for us. We literally hire a product or service to do some job, right? You know, and we usually think of it as some functional thing we have to do, right? A can opener opens a can. Well, you hired that can opener to do a job. The job was to quickly and eat more easily and efficiently open a can and you could do it yourself. That technically was the functional job. Well, the question though becomes, besides just these basic functional jobs that we all buy a product or service to do for us, what else are out there that you can find gaps and find pains to innovate to? And the two big ones that people usually don't think about are emotional and social jobs. So when you think about what you do, what Meals on Wheels does, um, what uh, you do with the city, what all of you do, cybersecurity, 
the customer is hiring you and your service to do some job. Usually you're probably thinking of that in terms of some very basic functional job that you do. Here's the service I provide. Here's the product I sell you. But there are other things you need to consider about the emotional and social, especially now in COVID. One of the biggest things within COVID that McKinsey studies have come out with is that safety is the new value. Customers look at everything that we purchase in terms of safety right now, um, whether that's physical safety, distancing, emotional safety, right? Um, how I'm perceived. So you need to look at through, through your customers, the lens in, in three terms. How do I meet their needs and this job to be done that they want done in terms of functional, emotional, and social? Well, it's not just nice to say, right? It sounds fluffy and okay, it's a job to get done emotionally, socially. Well, again, back to McKinsey's study here from the last recession, why it's important to focus on the customer's needs and think about it as a customer experience, right? When you look at their functional, emotional, and social, that's how they experienced your product or service. Those companies that focused really on the customer experience at a really high level versus those that didn't out of the last recession came out of it with a 300% increase in revenue than those that did not focus on the customer experience. So we looked at innovation and having a big jump and now it's customer experience. So if we innovate to the customer's needs through innovation, they're more apt to stay with us. They're more apt to tell friends that they, you know, to use us, they're more loyal. So it's that feeling that you are, you're focusing on their needs versus focusing internally. I got to cut costs. I got to cut, um, you know, head counts and I got to close the store and I got to find more efficient ways to make things. That's all supply side internal focus and that's table stakes. But the customer doesn't care about that. The customer cares about what you are doing for them, how you're meeting their new needs and their new values. And if you're focused on their experience, they get it. It's how you make them feel they're going to remember. And those that do it have a financially huge reward of 300% more than those that don't. So that's why we want to focus on it. So let's give two examples of what we consider this jobs to be done. What does this look like? You know, it sounds cool, but what does it look like in practice? So here's one for Lyft. So when you think about ride sharing, and we all probably do them you know, sometime or another, why do we use a ride share? Why do we use Lyft? Well, I'm in a situation here when I, what, when I need to get somewhere but can't or don't want to drive myself. This is, this is my need, right? Um, so what specific jobs do I want to get done? And not just functional, but emotional and social. So I want to have a ride home within minutes. I want to pay automatically. I want to feel safe while on my ride. So this is very functional, right? I'm gonna get my little annotation tool. Bear with me, easier to see, here we go. Pay automatically, functional. Feel safe on my ride, that's much more emotional, right? So this is a real job that you wanna get done, um, knowing that you're getting into a car with some stranger. Um, and before Uber and Lyft, we never would have done that, right? You would call a taxi cab. You, most of us don't hitchhike on the road. But now it's okay because there's structure around it. You think that there's, um, you know, checkups or certifications. There should be some safety with it. There's, there's reviews, the five-star reviews on the app. Okay, this guy's good. So this job is getting done for you. That's one of the things you want done. So then you have expectations as a customer. What gains and positive outcomes do I want to happen or um, assume should happen? And what pains or issues do I wanna make sure I alleviate or do that don't happen? And then so you look at goals and expected outcomes. So I want this to happen so I can what? So I can avoid planning and scheduling ahead of time. That's the, that's the gain I want. So I can skip money transactions with the driver. So I can relax and use that time to catch up on work, email, and news. So these are the positive gains or the pains you want eliminated. And these are the jobs that you want to get done, functional, emotional, and social. You might just say, yeah, we just have a, a rideshare app and you can get a ride somewhere. Well, 
that's minimal. What else can you do? And if you really dig into the customer's needs, you'll see more. So let's look at another really interesting example that's not so um, easy to understand or easy to perceive. So milkshakes. So this is a really, this is when jobs to be done, one of the very first case studies about a decade ago that came out, maybe even 15 years. Um, Clayton Christensen, a very famous professor at Harvard and consultant and author. They, he had McDonald's hired him to look at why people are buying milkshakes in the morning. This was really interesting. And there's a whole Harvard Business Review article you can look on it. And so they said, we want to understand why people are buying milkshakes in the morning. How do we sell more of them? And I had no, you know, you wouldn't normally think people are buying milkshakes in the morning, right? Mostly lunch or dinner. So they assumed that the conventional perspective, the job to get done, that people were buying milkshakes because it tasted good. They just wanted something sweet. When they asked people leaving McDonald's, interviewed them, why did you buy a, a, a milkshake here in the morning? What they discovered was a completely different job to get done than they perceived. And the job to get one, to get done by the customers was they bought these milkshakes in the morning because it kept them full on their way to work until they could actually get to their desk and get some, you know, a, a lunch or something real to eat because it's too hard to eat while you're in rush hour traffic, right? So they wanted something they could easily sip on through a straw, but was more than just a regular drink that was more filling to keep them uh, full. So this was really, really groundbreaking that you know you're assuming one thing just because shakes are sweet you're buying because you want something sugary no they could care less about that they wanted it because it was filling and they wanted to keep full on the way to work so that then lets a another whole uh, area of questioning well what can we do with the milkshakes to even improve and sell more of them now knowing that this is why somebody's buying them so just a really interesting interesting example there I'm going to stop for a second because I've said a lot and trying to get through uh, some of these quickly so we can make sure we have questions at the end. But I wanted to stop now for a few questions before the next section on purpose. Do you have any questions or comments about the jobs to be done section or COVID in general and how it's affecting things? And don't be shy, there's only a, a few of you, so no, uh, no silly questions. Okay, if you throw, if you think of one, throw it in the chat room or you can just uh, unmute and ask it. All right. So we talked about how COVID is changing most industries, some more than others. And then we looked at why innovation is important from a financial perspective through crisis like COVID. And then figuring out that innovating to the customer's needs, the job to get done, their experience is really the key focus area, right? That's what we need to get to is those new needs. One of the other key things that happens, doesn't matter what size business, and it's getting more and more looked at with um, articles and studies and research, is around purpose and why. So, Many of you might have heard of Simon Sinek. I'm assuming you have, uh, maybe five whys. And this is pretty important. He kind of started a, a lot of this dialogue around what's your purpose? Why are you in business? And there's a whole lot of data now in the last decade and even more recently on those businesses that have a purpose, have values, make it known why they're in business long-term, actually have a huge significant financial advantage versus those of us who don't have a publicly stated values and purpose. And they call it the golden circle, trying to get five whys, right? And the theory is if you ask why five times, you're gonna usually get to the crux of the matter, why you do something. And so everybody kind of knows what you do, right? You sell meals on wheels, you sell cybersecurity services, I sell strategy innovation consulting services. Then you look at how, okay? Some organizations, you know, know how they do it. Um, you know, it uh, sets them apart. Maybe they have uh, a certain process, a logic model, a patented way they do things, whatever it might be. 
but rarely do you talk about why you do something. Nonprofits might be much more better at this than uh, for-profit businesses. But why are you in business? And it's not about making money. That's just um, table stakes. You have to do that to stay in business. But what's your purpose? What's your cause, your belief? Um, the very reason that you exist. And you as the leader, whether you're an entrepreneur starting a business or your manager in the business or executive, you have to make that crystal clear of why you're in business, what values you share, and that's how you bring the rest of your organization along with you to build the culture that you're looking for. You know, nowadays we talk about culture and you know, assessing organizational design and needs, and people want to improve culture, but most folks don't know how to improve it. The very first thing, looking at improving culture, first of all, you have to understand from a leader, what is the leader's values and why they're here? Then you need to communicate that to the rest of the organization and get them on board. And if they don't have the same shared values or purpose, then they probably shouldn't be in the organization, right? You, you may have heard of, you know, you get the right people on the bus, but are they in the right seats? And now they go on, you know, are they wanting to go in the same direction that, you know, you want the bus to go? And that's really important. And we'll look at why, again, from a financial perspective in just a minute. So even if you doc, you know, know what your why is, what's my purpose, um, you need to do certain things. What steps can you take to actually bring that purpose to life, make that a real thing within your organization? And the first one is, we just talked about discovering what that is. You might have had it in your head. Maybe you've said it to somebody once, but have you written it down? Do you really know? You know, your organizations, you know, your, look at your strengths, um, not your core capabilities, that's just what you do, but why you're in business, right? You want to discover why you're there. And usually starts with your values, your, your purpose as a leader. Then you want to craft that story. You literally need to physically put it on paper onto your website. And then you need to make it known. You have to activate it within the organization. You've got to tell everybody in the organization, here's our values, here's our purpose. You know, then you, from that, your vision statement, your mission statement happened, but it's all leading to you, why are we here? And then you can embed it. So once you've articulated it, you've told people, you've documented it, it's on your website, um, you try and actually embody that through you know, actions. Well, you don't wanna just talk the talk, you wanna walk the walk, but then you can embed it, it becomes second nature, right? And that takes time. But that means then you're into your strategic planning, you know, your, your yearly uh, strategic planning initiatives, your quarterly um, planning meetings. How are you embedding your purpose and why you're there? New ideas that come up, new projects that come up. Are they in alignment with your purpose and vision and why you're in business? That, or does this sound good because it's a new opportunity and you might make a dollar from it? But if it's not aligned with who you are, then you probably shouldn't pursue it. So that's really how you can embed it um, with everything else you're doing from a strategic planning, from an operational perspective. Why is that important? You know, it sounds fluffy. Um, maybe you're a believer, maybe you're not in, in the why and the purpose. Well, let's look at it from a financial perspective and from customers and employee feedback. So purpose-driven businesses. And this is a very recent study looking at it from the customer side. 72% of customers say they feel it's more important than ever to buy from companies that reflect their values. So right now in a time of crisis, chaos, we talked about that this opportunity because things have changed, customers' needs have changed. This is the perfect time for you to pivot or to make known your purpose and vision because your customers or even non-customers that might be looking at your, your industry as an adjacent substitute for maybe how they've done things, right? A new market they wanna enter. They're looking for someone to tell them, here's my values, here's my purpose. They want that. So now is a perfect time to transform yourself, to pivot from what you've been doing because everything's changing, right? So you wanna come out of this as, as a new kind of born company. The second one is, is staggering, actually. It's more about your employees. 
most employees in the US are completely disengaged from their work and they don't like the job they're in. Even if they tell you to your face they do, most don't. And here's the studies, Gallup poll just two years ago. The percentage of engaged workers in the US who are involved, enthusiastic about their job and committed to their work, it's only 34%. 53% say that they're not engaged at all. They're just kind of going through the motions. And 13% are actively disengaged. What does that mean? They're looking for other jobs. They're actually bad mouthing your company. Um, they're creating dissension in the bad culture. So this is, and it's nothing new. There's many studies out there that are very similar to this, but this is the most recent in Gallup poll. So are you looking at your, cust your employees and asking them um, face to face or in surveys that are anonymous? How are you making sure that they're engaged, they're happy, they're in the right job? And most importantly, most employees, they don't feel that their skills are being used to the ultimate, right? So you might have them doing something and they're like, yeah, but I'm, I'm trained in this and I'm good at this and you have me doing this basic menial job. So once they know your purpose and why you're in business and they're bought into that and you talk to them about what is it they want to do, now they're bought in, they're passionate. They become this 34% who are committed and enthusiastic because they have a purpose to come to work each day. The rest of these people, they have really no reason to be there except the paycheck. And the last one, you know, we're hiring, you know, the Gen uh, Zs, the millennials, these are all the new workers coming into, you know, your businesses um, that you're hiring. And these are the, uh, the next wave of people who are gonna be executives in the future. 83% of Gen Zers in the US consider a company's purpose when deciding to work there. And this again, a recent study, and there's even more LinkedIn, Indeed studies, all these things, hiring agencies, that the younger groups, they want to work where there's a purpose. They actually want to make a difference. And that doesn't mean, you know, saving the world from climate or, um, you know, energy, all these things. But whatever business you are in, how are they making a difference to the customer, uh, what purpose is it long term? You know, those are the things, the values that they are they find important. So now, if you're a skeptic on this, let's look at the financial stuff, just like we did previously. So this was a recent study from uh, Russell, um, and it looks at those hundred best companies to work for. Um, I, there's a, I have all these studies in case you guys want them, we can uh, follow up. But it looked at over the past decades, what are the best companies to work for rated by the employees and obviously lots of different things that go into that. But those companies that are rated at the highest of good companies to work for have a 300% return on their investments, you know, revenues than the bottom tier companies where people don't like working for them. So it's all about your employee engagement. They're gonna work harder and work, you know, stay with you longer. They're gonna be bought in. And as you probably know, if you have a business, your number one cost is your employees. It's hiring and onboarding somebody because the average stay is about two and a half years in an organization. And it costs you five to $10,000 to hire someone, to train them, and then to find the replacement. So if you can make sure to get people um, with same shared purpose, same values, they're excited, they know what they're doing, and they're happy that you are asking them to perform things that they want to do, they're gonna help you with a huge significant return for your business. Um, another study from uh, TDI World, Purposeful companies outperform the market by 42%, just straight revenue terms. And the last one is those purpose-led brands, their valuation. So if you're a startup, they grew 175% versus 70% for those firms that didn't have a purpose. So it is a big deal to document and to live a purpose and why you're in business. All right, so, um, 
I'm going to leave us some, definitely some time here to talk about questions and things you guys have. So what we covered though, COVID has changed the customer's needs for every market in the world. Uh, there's, there's no exceptions, but some more than others, as we can all well attest to. All businesses must innovate their offerings to meet the new jobs to be done for the customer. The question is for you, what are those new jobs? Are they functional, emotional, social? And next week and the week after, we're gonna talk about what tools can you use to specifically identify those new jobs in your industry. And companies that define and communicate their purpose and values to their customers and employees have a significantly higher financial return than those that don't. So this is a big one. So this week was all about very high level um, COVID is affecting us. Look at the change you need to the customer and also change and transform yourself and make sure people understand why you're in business and what your purpose is. What I recommend as next steps for you is to document your purpose, your values, your mission. Now spend this week as homework. If you don't already have them listed, figure out what those are. And it's not as easy as you think. You know, what is my purpose? And you can Google lots of examples um, depending on the industry you're at. Right? My purpose here is to educate executives on innovation to be able to make a difference to their customers, right? So they can grow. Um, my values, I'm just redoing my website to, to list all these things. You know, service, um, and heavily involved in Rotary, as well as faith, and then also you know, striving for excellence. So what are yours? Honesty, integrity, right? Things like that, uh, whether it's uh, um, very specific to you or an industry. And then your vision, right? To be uh, one of the leading strategy innovation consulting firms in the world. So that's the vision, but my purpose is more customer focused, right? So your purpose can't just be, I want to make $10 million a year. It's, that's all about just the money and the customer's not going to care. The purpose should be about that shared value that you're improving something from the customer's perspective. List what jobs you think the customer is needing to get done right now for your offerings, right? Think about it from the functional, emotional, and social perspective and see what you come up with. And then next week, we're gonna use tools to help you document this and actually refine those. Sign up as an SBDC client um, to get help. And if you do, and you're in the Placer region, then I can help you on these things. Go to market strategy, identifying these needs, getting a pitch deck if you're just starting. So all that stuff we can help with. And one of the other things that we do, this is really this more high level, the SBDC series this week and the next two weeks, right? Giving you a ton of info to think about. Um, from Sac State University, the Carlson Innovation Center, where I'm the entrepreneur uh, in residence there, we do a toolkit series for, for startups, but also for small businesses maybe looking to innovate in certain areas. And it's a five-week series that's two hours each Wednesday night and I've listed the link here for you. So it's a much deeper dive. And what it goes through are the tools and every piece of the journey to create your business plan, your business model, and potentially your investor pitch deck if you're trying to start an idea. So depending on where you are in your journey. So let's uh, open it up for questions. And we've got a uh, perfect uh, 15 minutes uh, we left for questions for you guys. So feel free to unmute and ask away. Good, Rod says, how is purpose different from a mission statement? Good question. So I'm gonna, I wish I had another uh, chart here, but think of your mission statement as the, I'm gonna, actually go back screens as the outer wheel. So here is your why, your purpose, um, you know, how you do things, what you do. You could also think of this as your vision statement out here and, and you're, you probably are going to have values and then a vision statement. What's a vision statement? Well, a vision statement is a 10 year maybe even 30 year, if you're someone like Intel, Google, Apple, they have a 30 year vision statement. 
Intel's vision statement is to connect every human in the world to the internet, right? Well, how do they do that? Well, they sell um, semiconductors, right? They go into laptops and data centers and devices, but their vision is to connect everyone. Their mission statement is usually a one to three year goal to get to that mission, that vision statement. So think of your mission statement as what you're trying to do right now for the next one to three years. You're trying to be the premier meal delivery service in Placer County. That could be a mission statement for the next three years. Your vision could be, we want to um, you know, service 10 million customers in Northern California. Well, that could be a 10 year goal, right? So, and then your values are next and then your purpose. Why are you in business, right? To whatever that is. So think of your mission statement as right now, it's that one to three year goal that is in line to get you to that really huge, they call them BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goal. And that comes from actually from Intel back in the 70s and 80s, the founders created this, this term that now is being used by Google and Apple and Facebook. You'll hear BHAG, big, big, hairy, audacious goal. And that's your vision statement. So what is your big, hairy, audacious goal? And then pull back, what's your next mission statement to get there in the next one to three years? And that could be more financially focused, you know, customer, uh, very specific uh, thing you're gonna do. Great question. Who else has got some questions? I don't see anything in the chat. Could be about starting, it could be about um, finding new needs. Nicole, any questions that you have? Maybe you can be a plant. Then I'll ask a, a different thing and why you're still thinking of questions. Um, I'd love to hear what um, key insights that you either took away from today or that you still have you know, questions on that you're still trying to figure out uh, you know, the biggest gray areas for you. So either insights positive or still can question areas. So Sequoia says getting started feels overwhelming. Yes, for an entrepreneur, that is the biggest thing, um, and you're not alone. That's everyone, and myself included. And think of it this way: um, not that it's going to help, you know, help you um, functionally, but maybe emotionally. Is think of a startup as a rocket, and ninety percent of all the effort is just to get off the ground, and the other ten percent is once you're going, it's pretty easy cruising, right? But all the effort in a rocket, just like in a startup, is to get off the ground between funding and research and business plan, business models, partnerships, your channels, right, making physically of something, or manufacturing. It's, it's exhausting. It's stressful. It's a lot of work. And so this is exactly why I come back to, to this, the golden circle. If you're not doing something that you're going to wake up to every day as an entrepreneur and say, I know why I'm doing this. What's my purpose? You know, this is my passion. Then you're going to probably put it aside. It's going to become a hobby versus a startup. And this is critical. We talked about this with the Carlson Center. People who do a side hustle and you kind of have it there and you're like, oh, it's kind of floundering. I can't really get it going. That's because it's a hobby. It's you put more money into it than you're getting out of it because you haven't made it your priority. You don't know how to move forward, which is what we're here for, SPDC and the Placer Resource Center, to help you get funding, get your business model written, understand uh, assumptions and, and do some business testing, right, to answer these unknown big questions. But you got to start with this why and your values. And so that will keep you going with that, you know, northern star of why am I doing this, right? You know, the what you do is is very functional, but why you're doing it is really important. 
great question, Sequoia. Any other insights? Um, I'll ask it this way. What's the best thing you took away from today? What's the one thing you're like, ah, that's cool. I'm going to remember that. I'm going to write that down just for, for me to um, educate me, to help me get better at delivering these things. I'd love to know what you guys liked from today's presentation. Uh, and then we'll talk about the bad stuff, what I can do better. So, but I'd love to know what resonated with you guys, which concepts, um, you know, which data, which statistics, you know, whatever it, whatever it is that uh, floats your boat. Okay, Rod, I see in the lift chart, cool, okay. And Sequoia, Purpose Fibbon, got it, that's, that's, uh, that's good. I'm glad that hit home. So the, the jobs to be done, I'm curious if any of you have heard, um, heard it in that way about, you know, pains and gains and functional, emotional, social jobs to get done. Um, and if, if so, great. If not, we're going to really dig into that next week on what are some real tools, um, frameworks, methodologies that we can use to find this um, new pain uh, that a customer has, right? A new problem. Sequoia said the stats uh, prove that. Uh, okay, makes you feel good. Good, I'm glad. What things that we went through today um, maybe didn't resonate or maybe were confusing that I could do a better job of either articulating or maybe a different uh, slide or video. So I'd love to know which things you thought were still a little gray or, or confusing to you. And while you're thinking Sequoia, it, it, um, I believe you need to register each week, um, but that's a great question. So yes, go. I would go on and just make sure that you need to register. It's uh, the next three, so two more weeks in a row after this. And next week is really where we're gonna get into the meat of things about using tools to find those customers' new unmet needs. Um, pains, problems, right? And then we'll talk also about testing and validating. Is there enough people that actually have that problem? So if it's five people, that's not a big market, right? But if it's, you know, maybe 50,000 people, that's a market. So we're gonna talk about those as well. Karina says, work from home has changed how people feel, security. Um, I wonder how my work can help them more emotionally and socially. Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially for you guys, uh, Karina from Cyber with uh, Envia, it's mostly, I think, been B2B, right? And focused on uh, both commercial and public sector. Then yes, the, the person working from home, maybe they are an employee of a customer, but they're remote now, right? So I would love to talk to you guys more about that with Shoba. How can you look at those functional, emotional, you know, I'm not, uh, getting viruses on my home computer where my you know kids are doing homework and it's you know my you know my personal information's here and um i feel like going on the web and a zoom and all these things you know you hear about well it's un it's unsecure i absolutely think that's a big area for you guys to take a look at because it's probably not being met in many areas Good, good, con good ideas, good comments. Uh, anyone else uh, thoughts on um, slides? Maybe that uh, too many, too busy. I'd love to to hear any. Uh, I'm always like you. Always want to get better and improve on things, or dig in deeper to areas that you really thought were cool, so we can spend more time on them. Okay, Ali, so you're uh, still a little confused on starting a business, right? I get it, you got a business license, what to do next, insurance, okay. So yes, that is something the SBDC and Nicole Plaza Resource Center we can help with. So very simple, that's like basic, right? Let's, you know, you gotta get 
the county license, you gotta get registered with the city, you gotta put an ad in the paper so people know you're a real business. Um, that's all very basic stuff you can do. Um, then it's, and you might not need any insurance depending on what you're doing. Then it's all about, okay, how do we uh, create our business model, our business plan to market? Um, so we can absolutely help you with that right out of the gate. Who's our target customer and what's the problem they have? And when we talk about, and for you actually, I would sign up to the Sac State uh, Toolkit series that we, we do starting next Wednesday for five weeks. It is a deep dive from I've got an idea to how to get funding. And we talk about creating that business model, not so much about you know where, where to go get your license, but how do I put my idea on paper and then validate that the problem I think exists with the market I think is there is real. And then how do I create that product market fit with my minimum viable product, right? MVP you might've heard of. We go through all that. Thank you, Nicole, for putting the uh, registration link up there for next week. Absolutely. And real quick, Ali, if you have additional questions, feel free to give me a call directly. I'm happy to answer whatever questions we can for you and we'll get you connected um, with the Carlson Center and their programs that they have going on or SBDC. We'll find the, the best fit for you. Yeah, and, and I think they're complimentary. So, right, we want to help you. I want to help you as an SBDC consultant locally with Nicole and the uh, Placer region. Um, but then but for other free services, these are free services from the Carlson Center, you know, starting next week, a two hour every Wednesday night deep dive for five weeks, um, really from the entrepreneur mindset and how do you uh, get going and, and develop that business plan. And then I can help you individually, you know, again, using these SBDC and Placer resource services as a consultant for you. So we can take that information you learn and go offline one-on-one -on -one and really help you uh, with your business. Yeah, so Sequoia, interesting comment there. Yeah, maybe uh, offline we'll have to talk more about your, uh, you know, the ethics and that. So it sounds like purpose is a big one for you. So with, if you don't have any more questions, we're perfectly right at the top of the hour. And I hope that you'll join next week and then hopefully tell other people to join so we can get more of, uh, of you and Placer region here to get the knowledge you need and the skills to help you either start or grow your current business. And I appreciate uh, your time. I actually going to make sure I put my um, information back up to you guys. I think we have the Placer resource. Oh, here we go. Um, through that, you can get to me, but uh, Strategy Innovation Institute, um, SI2 Blue is my uh, website. And if you guys, um, let me let me put it in the chat real quick here, if I can find it. My information. I can help you get signed up with SBDC if you need. So again, you can send me an email, and we'll help you get all squared away with any of these resources. All right, Nicole, I'll turn to you for any last comments. Uh, no, that was excellent. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, and I resent uh, your contact information uh, in the chat, so everybody had that. And um, just if anybody has any questions regarding any of the services that Brian had talked about, the Placer Business Resource Center, Sierra, SBDC, you, Whatever it is, please feel free to give me a call. We are here for you. We know this is a, a difficult time that all these businesses are going through. And um, if there's anything that you need, you know, please feel free to, to reach out to us. Other than that, I think that's, that's all I have. Okay. And you guys can all email me for the link for the Sac State Toolkit series if you are don't have it. Um, I'm, Nicole, how do we make these slides available for everybody? Uh, 
I will go ahead and email Jess and we can get these slides out to everybody who has registered and we can send those to you via email. Great, very good. And you can email me people again for the toolkit link. So have a great rest of the day. Look forward to seeing you next week and uh, or uh, shoot me an email. Thanks for your time. I'll go ahead and stay on for a few minutes in case there's anybody who has any additional questions. Yes, I will too. Thank you, Rod. Thanks, Sequoia. Thanks, Allie. Karina. You uh, pull up a uh, couple of slides and get to the pictures so we can use. I'm going to stop recording.